Welcome to our evening service. How are you all doing? Are you ready to encounter a touch from God? I heard your service overflow into the children's room this morning. I hope you didn't hear us overflowing to you. We tried to raise our volume to squash out your volume. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was all good. But we're excited to be in the house of the Lord. And so, Lord, we welcome your presence and we just give you praise for what you're going to do tonight. We give you praise for the lives that will be touched, set free and healed. Lord, be with our worship band as we've already prayed, Lord, and that your anointing would be upon them. Be with Pastor in his absence, almighty God. Touch he and Natalie, refresh them, oh God, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Spirit of the Lord is 
figured if I kept singing, you might get it eventually.
Aren't you glad he's fighting that battles tonight?
stand up from the ashes your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light lifting our sorrows and bearing our burdens and healing our hearts to our god we lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. And chains have been broken, and eyes have been opened. An army of dry bones is starting to rise. And death is defeated, and we are victorious, for you are alive, oh yeah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice, sing it hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice, sing it hallelujah. Hallelujah, sing it hallelujah. Hallelujah, sing it our voices and sing it, sing it hallelujah.
In Revelations 4, it says, And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And did they, they did not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. I think tonight we're a room full of living people. I believe that we're a room full of people that are able to bow down before the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we can give him honor. We don't need to let our worship team do all the work, but right now, right here, we could just begin to say, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy are you, O oh God. God, we lift your name on high in this place. God, we're not gonna let the rocks and the hills cry out before us. We're not gonna let the animals and the trees wave their branches before you without us giving you the proper praise. Worthy are you tonight, O oh God. Worthy are you tonight. If you need to bow before the Lord and invoke his presence, then bow before him. If you need to lift your hands, then lift those burdened hands and give him the praise. But let's invite the presence of the Lord. Let's welcome his presence here because we are going to see mighty works of him tonight. But his presence requires our praise. Worthy are you, O oh God. Worthy are you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Worthy, worthy are you, almighty God. Worthy are you, mighty Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. One day we're all going to stand before him, if we could, because there will be many that won't. And it says in the word of God that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I want to confess it here on earth. I don't want to wait till that day. I want to confess it here and now. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy of all the praise and all the glory in this house, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you praise, God. We give you praise. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you, O God, that we find ourselves before your throne, O God. We thank you for this beautiful and marvelous spirit, oh God. We feel your presence. We know your touch, oh God. And we don't want to do anything else before we come in the feet of Jesus. And praying and, and seek your face tonight, Father. First of all, oh God, we want to thank you for who you are, oh God. Yes, we are a needy people, Father. We are a needy people. We need many things, oh God. Some of us, we need healing. Some of us, we need the restoration. Some of us, we need to get saved, oh God. Some of us, we need to walk deeper with you, Father. Hallelujah. But we don't want to do anything before we fall on our feet and our knees and say, Lord Jesus, teach how to pray. Teach us, Father, to, to, to depend on you, to stay with you, and to, to, to uplift your name, O oh God. So, Father, we thank you, O oh God, for this blessing opportunity, Father. We thank you for the praise that we, we sang tonight, O oh God. And the rest of this service, O oh God, we pray that you will be with us in a special way, O oh God. We pray that, Lord Jesus, you are the, 
the head of this church tonight, oh God. And you like to walk in our midst, oh God. As you walk in our midst, Lord Jesus, we pray that we increase our faith. Our faith will be increased to touch you, to receive you, oh God, to walk towards you and to welcome you in our hearts, oh God. Hallelujah. This is our desire. This is our plan tonight. That's not going to be just another service, Father. But we're going to be whether we touch you. And we don't want to go home the way we come in, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, Father, the rest of this service, Father, we pray blessing for your word, oh God. As your servant breaks the bread of life, that no one will say it's for somebody else, but everyone will say it's for me, and I'll receive, oh God. It's my need, it's my life, and it's my bread that I need so much, oh God. Father, Oh, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in our midst in a special way with the signs and wonders and miracles we want to see it. And we need the Father. We know, Father, that there is so many people that have been sick for so many years, oh God, and they doesn't know how to pray anymore. They've been praying for so long and they doesn't have anymore the words to pray, Father. But when together tonight, when the altar come takes place, Father, we all going to gather together and pray for one another, oh God. And you, Jesus, you will lift your name. You will glorify your name in our midst. And in such a way, Lord Jesus, that's where we want to honor you, Father. We want to glorify you, oh God. So, Father, the rest of this service, we put it in the mighty hand of Jesus, the one you pay the price, the one that he loves to embrace and, and, and embrace every one of us, oh God, in a such a way that no other ones will be able to do it, but only you, Jesus. We thank you for your precious blood. We thank you, oh God, that our name is written in the book of life, oh God. And tonight we rejoice together in the mighty name of Jesus, the one that we love, the one that we will come is coming soon, the one that's going to be in our midst tonight with, with the signs and wonders and miracles, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So, Father, stir our hearts, increase our faith, prepare our hearts to receive you, whatever our need. Lord Jesus, sometimes to us it seems impossible, oh God, but to you everything is possible, oh God. Everything, oh God. So we give it to you in the mighty name of Jesus, the rest of this service, that you are so good and you are mighty, oh God. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for what you're going to do it tonight, oh God, in our midst, oh God. We give you praise and we give you glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, Lord. Praise God. Turn to somebody next to you, your left, your right. Say, tonight's your night for a miracle. Amen. Welcome each other into the house of the Lord. Welcome once again. It's on. It is on. I seem quieter. That's good for me. 
So welcome once again. Any visitors for the first time in our midst tonight? Any visitors? I know one, our dear pastor brother here and our friend up here in the front row. Ushers, if we could bless them with a welcome bag. We have um, two gentlemen in the front. And... Owen, could you get two welcome bags for them, please? We're going to uh, collect the offering in just a wee moment. I want to share something I shared with you with the kids on Friday night. Of course, I'm not going to tell you everything I told them, but I'm going to tell you something that struck me. Uh, so this sermon for them was called, What Will You Do When the Lord Shows Up on Your Doorstep? So think about that as you prepare your offering. Then the Lord appeared to him in Genesis chapter 18 by the <clears throat> terebith tree of memory as he was sitting in the tent in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran, down, ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed before to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight... Do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. So Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, and gave it to the young man, and he hastened him to prepare it. And so he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. I'm not sure if you got the little message in that message, but he did it quick and he hastened it. And he went and he said, prepare to his wife, prepare three salas of, of flour, three salas. If you calculate it all in the end, it's going to be 21 cups of flour. Now, if you've made a loaf of bread in the house, you're going to know it requires a minimum loaf, four cups. How many loaves did he make then, right? So this, he made a lot of bread. Then when he went to get a calf, any farmers in the house, a calf is not 10, 10, 15 pounds. It's not like a little baby that we give birth to, anywhere from 6 to 10 pounds. This was a calf at the potential of maybe 100 pounds. He said to them, come stay for a morsel. A morsel of bread. He prepared for them a feast. Imagine if we were to apply that to our pocketbook. <laughs> I'm not guilting you. I'm just saying imagine. <laughs> so let's imagine. Imagine we said, Lord, I'm going to give you a morsel tonight. What if we had the heart of Abraham? Three men. And in the, in the version tonight, as I read to you, he sat and watched as they ate. A hundred pound calf. That's one Mandarin feast. More than I can handle. Right? That's more food than my stomach can handle. And how many loaves of bread? Potential, yeah. No, actually, I, did, I said the math wrong to you, but it equates to about 21 loaves of bread. Can you imagine? That much bread? Dipping and eating? That's a lot, right, sister? That's a lot of food. Let's prepare our offering and give. One thing that Abraham did, he gave the best. He could have called one of his 318 servants, come prepare this calf for me. And, and he could have, he, he went to Sarah, but he was involved in the preparation. He just didn't say, oh, go prepare this to the, to the uh, servant and to his wife, oh, go prepare this. But he was involved in the preparation. Be involved in your giving, be involved in your belief that the Lord will provide for all of your needs. I know you have more wants than you have needs, but he'll provide for all of your needs. And the word says that he will do exceedingly abundantly more than what we ask. So you know that thing you're asking for? Watch out for the more. 
but be like Abraham. Have a heart like Abraham. When you say a morsel, refer as, think of that morsel as a hundred pound heifer. <laughs> think of it as a hundred pound cow and 21 loaves of bread. Think of it as that much. Ushers, would you come forward? It's all his money, isn't it? It's only loaned to us. It's all his. God bless you. Brother, would you pray? Gracious Lord, we come to you again this evening with thankful hearts. We thank you, Lord, for all your provisions for each one here. No matter how great or how small, we give you praise. We thank you for this offering. And we ask your blessing be upon it. In your name, amen. Man, the Lord bless you as you give and know that he will bless you back more than you could imagine or think. Can we show the announcement video? And also let's remember next Sunday night, Pastor Christoph, formerly one of our pastors of this house, will be here ministering in the evening service. Let's remember to keep Pastor Ray and Sister Natalie up in prayer as they are away this week in some very busy meetings pastors ministering and, and also in some heavy meetings in preparation for our conference. So keep them covered in your prayers daily as you're reading your word and going before the Lord. Remember the leadership of this house and uh, may the Lord bless you as you watch this video. Hey, this is Pastor Kirby here with Pastor Melody. How you doing? I'm good and how are you? I'm doing great. It's good that when people ask you how you do it. I know. It yeah. makes you feel good. So what's happening this month? What happening is that there's a lot of happening this month in our church. We're always so that busy. I know. But uh, you listen, on Sunday, August 6th, 10 a.m. and, and 6 p.m. That's good. We're having a special guest, T.G. Malkenji. So he's going to give us a powerful message on revival, and you don't want to miss that. And the following Sunday is... August the 13th is going to be our Super Sunday for our children's ministry as well as August 27th and that is for ages 5 to 11. They come straight to Sunday school at 10 a.m. It's an awesome morning of worship, games, and God's Word and you don't want to miss out plugging your kids into that and inviting the neighborhood kids. As well, Kirby, yeah. guess what else is happening? We're having our church picnic. Say yay to Family church picnic? Yeah, it's a family <laughs> church picnic. All right, so following our morning worship service on Sunday, August the 20th, we're going to head over to Mohawk Park, and each of us are going to bring a pot blessing because we're going to bless each other with some food. Mm. So bring something culturally relevant to you, or if not, just some food that you can share with everyone else. And uh, we'll spend the afternoon there for some fellowship after our morning worship service here, of course. But because of spending the afternoon at the park we will not have an evening service so that's what else is actually happening i think something else of course I mean, the, the month is not done yet no, no. but we have to fill this month with something it's true you know so on saturday and august 26 at 7 p.m we're gonna have our urdu punjabi and english service you rock that oh man i know i know i you think said I, that so I, well. I, I think i got that amen so we want to come we want, to, we want you to join with us and enjoy a time of international worship preaching and we're going to have, of course, some food. Yeah. So that's good. It wouldn't be New City without yeah. food. <laughs> there you go. And also in family movie night on Sunday, August 27 at 6 p.m. So we're going to enjoy a time of relaxed of relax fellowship and having fun entertainment and mm, popcorn. With popcorn. So be with us. And also, don't forget our monthly newsletter. You know, there's so much thing going on in the church. We cannot say everything, but uh, check out our newsletter. Uh, you can download it on the website or you can get one at the front desk when you come to the church. Yeah, God Don't bless miss you. a Sunday at New City. Of course not. God bless you. And you too. You have a great day. <laughs> one more thing regarding the Mohawk part. If you want to sit at the picnic, bring a long chair. Otherwise, you might have to bring a blanket and sit on the grass. But bring a long chair. And you know what? We are going to go so far as even putting signs up to tell you where we're going to be, what pavilion to look out for. So I promise you, you'll be well instructed as to where to go that day when you arrive at Mohawk Park. So do not fret. Um, there's one more thing. The movie night, we're hoping to bring you the case for Christ. Isn't that good? Yeah, you, you need to invite your friends out to see that. It was just in the theaters not too long ago. But you need to bring your friends out, and uh, it's going to be an awesome night. Amen. Amen. 
Yeah. Not partial, but we are. All right. God bless you. I'm partial. Amen. Can we give God some praise? Is God good? Is God good? Is God good? And all the time? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present our speaker tonight. You already know if you were here this morning. He know who he is. You know, I've, I've, I've been always excited when it comes to preaching. And I'm trying to be on fire all the time. But this man is on fire. This man is a bomb. It's an explosion of, 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 of Bible. Amen? So, you know, if, if you were here this morning, I don't want you to welcome this man of God the same way you did this morning. We're not going to praise him. We're praising the anointing God gave him. Are you clear on that? So, uh, if you were blessed this morning, can I hear an amen? amen? You see, that's not enough. That's an amen for me. That's, that's, that's an amen for when you go to sleep. Okay? If you were blessed this morning, if you come here tonight with a heart of expectation, I want you to say, God. Okay, some of you got it. Some of you got it. Can we, can we do it again? God. I am, I am expecting my miracle, my miracle tonight. tonight. God, God I'm, expecting I'm expecting my deliverance, my deliverance tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. Tonight, I am, I am free. Ah, oh, you didn't got it. You didn't got that. You didn't got that. Tonight, tonight. by the grace of God, because God won it. I am living free, 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 get up on your feet, free, 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 can you say free, free, can you say hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, we got some praise, can we welcome our brother TJ, and let's pray for him, as tonight God will use him for something mighty. Amen. So God, we lift him or we lift we lift him up to you, O Lord. As we as he bring forth your word. He bring forth your power and your authority. God, we want to be excited for you tonight. We want to be expect we want to expect glory in in your word tonight. So God, touch this man. Touch your servant. As he speak on your behalf. Use him as you please. And God, we are here, standing up on your feet, waiting for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say, amen. amen. Thank amen. you, Lord. Give Jesus a round of applause. How many of you were here this morning? You may all be seated. How many of you were here this morning? Lift your hand. Amen. How many of you, it's your first time, or you weren't here this morning? And that's not to throw you under the bus for missing church this morning. That's just for my own personal data system that I need to collect who's here and who's not here. Hallelujah. 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 The Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Who has blessed us, not will bless us, who has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Lift your hands all over this place. Father, we come to you tonight in the name that is above every name. The precious name of your servant, your Messiah, your Christ, Jesus the Son of God. Lord, we thank you that your word says that until now we've asked nothing in that name, but we are to ask in that name and we shall receive whatsoever things we ask that our joy may be complete, that our joy may be made full, that our joy may be made in abundance. Father, we thank you that whatever has been holding us down up until this day has no permission to carry out to carry, to, to carry out on 
our back as we leave this place tonight. Father, I thank you that there's nothing that's weighed down any single person on the sound of my voice that has permission by divine decree to leave with them here tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that sick bodies will be healed in Jesus' name. I curse cancer in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I curse multiple cirrhosis in the name of Jesus Christ. I curse diabetes. I curse high blood pressure and I curse low blood pressure. I curse everything that Jesus didn't have in his body and doesn't have in his body now. I curse it. It's under our feet and it dies now in Jesus name. I thank you Lord for deaf ears are going to come open tonight. I thank you Father that blind eyes and eyes that are hard of seeing will come open tonight. I thank you that you said that if we will only believe and ask in that name you will come through for us because you're not a dead God but you are the faithful one the true one and what you said you'll do you do and in the name of Jesus Christ we prayed all these things and everyone says Amen. we're gonna have a great night tonight Amen. turn your Bibles to Matthew 6 tonight I'm, pre I'm preaching on prayer that commands results Prayer that commands results. Because how many of you know there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things? People who can pray for years and years and years and never receive an ounce of results. Some people, they pray, they get a little result. Some people, they pray, they get fantastic results. What's the difference? The difference isn't because Jesus loves them more than you. It's not because God loves them more than anyone else. The Bible says in Acts 10.34, that God does not show any partiality. That means he doesn't have any favorites. The only thing he does is he'll re welcome anyone in any nation who fears him and comes to him and does what is right. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 that without faith it is impossible to please God. That means without faith it's not possible to please God. It's impossible to make God happy as you walk in doubt, unbelief, and skepticism. The Bible says a prerequisite to coming to God is that you have to believe that He is. He that comes to God must believe that He is. That doesn't just mean that you believe that Jesus, is, that Jesus ex exists or that God exists. It means that you believe that God is who He says He is and that He'll do what He says He'll do. Then this is the part that gets lost in modern day Christianity. The Bible says he who comes to Him must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. People have a hard time saying that these days because they've got some religious brainwashed that's hit their hit their minds and completely contorted the way they think to think that you know we're just to serve God without any expectancy without any results that's how Muslims serve their God because their God doesn't answer their prayer so they're taught not to expect anything but we don't serve Allah we serve Jesus Christ the one who was dead but behold he lives and he lives forevermore and Jesus said behold I go to the Father but the works that you see me do, you'll do, and you'll do greater. Then he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Not I will not, not I might do it. Not I'll see if I'm in a good mood that day. And based on that judgment, I'll do it or I won't do it. Maybe I'll slap you that day. Maybe I'll hug you that day. I don't know. Some people, they, dip, they have a picture of Jesus that he's some schizophrenic nutcase who doesn't know what he wants with people. That's why you have people that are up and down in Christianity because their view, it's not God changing. It's, it's not even the devil harassing them most of the time. It's because their, their image of who God is fluctuates like a roller coaster, up and down. Look in Deuteronomy 1. You see that God told the people to go and take possession of the promised land. But the Bible says that they did not obey the commandment of God. Nevertheless, they rebelled against the Lord their God in that they did not go up. Why? Because they said, he, God only brought us out of Egypt to destroy us in this wilderness. They had a poor picture of who God was. And as a result, they lived, they lived around that mountain for 40 years. They, crossed, they went in that wilderness. But then there came a day where God got fed up. And he said, you've dwelt along this mountain long enough. Now pick up your bags. It's time to see the promised land. Some of you here tonight, you've never heard a message like this, but this is God's prophetic word for you. You've dwelt there long enough. Time to rise up, pick up your bags, and take everything God has for you. In Jesus' mighty name. Shout amen. amen. 
So there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. When you come to God, you have to have faith. Tonight, I'm going to, pray on, I'm going to preach on prayer that commands results. But there's some things I have to line up before you get to that, to, to that, that area of, of praying prayers that command results. You can't do things incorrectly, ways that the Bible does not prescribe, and then expect God to honor that. God doesn't honor anything that's outside of His Word. That's why Proverbs Proverb says, Take firm hold of instruction. Keep her and lay hold of it, for she is your life. You can't ignore the instructions that God outlined in His Word. That's what creates frustration in people's lives. They, the Bible says, a man's foolishness twists his way. That means a man's foolishness, foolish ways, actually contorts his life and distorts his life. And then his heart gets angry against God. People, they, they do things incorrectly. I mean, what would you do if I, I went out on the, the interstate or the highway and I started driving on the wrong side of the road? And then the officer pulls me over and he says, what the heck are you doing? And I tell him, well, officer, know my heart. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. It doesn't matter what's in your heart. It's actions that prove value in God's eyes. The Bible says God is a God who weighs people's actions. The Bible says, the Lord, like the refining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, the Lord tests people's hearts and their actions. So you've got to line up your way of doing things with the way God prescribes and outlined in scriptures. That's why the Bible says this book, First, uh, it's either in First Peter, I think it's Second Peter 1, that God moved upon 40 different authors and inspired them prophetically to write down this book called the Bible. Why? Not for our entertainment. It's not so that we can have stories to read before bedtime. It's not so we can read, you know, some stories to our children because we're not, you know, going to go out and buy another uh, one of those pop-up books so we have, we have some material to read our children. That's what it's for. This book is an inspired, the Bible says, all scripture is what? God breathed, God inspired. Then it says it's profitable for correction, for instruction, and for training. You have to be trained up. It's a poor, a poor student that doesn't study and goes to a test. No wonder they fail every time. Some of you have been going through the same test for a thousand years, and you've failed every single time. Why? Not because God has given up on you, but because you've given up on the scriptures. But tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, as you're taught what the word of God says, and this book gets into your spirit, fired up, it'll become like a fire shut up in your bones. You're not going to stay lazy. You're going to run your course. You're going to fight the good fight of faith. You will lay hold of eternal life into everything God has promised for you in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 6. The Bible says from verse 5, when you pray, so that means you have to pray. You can't complain that God's not answering your prayer if you've never prayed. The Bible actually says in Luke 18 that th this parable Jesus spoke to them so that men are always to pray and never to lose heart. Are always to pray. Not sometimes. Constant prayer. Thessalonians 5.17. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray always. Do not cease to pray. Jude 20. Praying always. Building yourself up on your most holy faith. It's always, it's always a constant in the Bible. It, God doesn't fluctuate in his, in his ways of doing things. Pray always in the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 6. I ask that men pray always. Paul, in every, pretty much every letter, he starts off by saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always praying for you. In, in, I think it's in Samuel. Far be it from me that I should cease to pray for you. That's talking about supplication, you know, intercessory prayer. But tonight we're going to deal with, you know, praying for your own needs. But the, the principle remains the same. God can't stand wavering people. Can't. People that are like up and down all the time. God, God it's not that God hates you. I'm not saying that. Get in here. I don't want you to think that. People go through, you know, things that are really... They, 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 you know, they don't pray for, it's not like God hates you if you haven't prayed in two weeks. That's, that's heresy. But God, the Bible says in James 1, that he that wavers is like the waves of the sea tossed to and fro. Then it says, God will never answer any of that man's prayers. 
It says, let not that man expect to receive one thing from the Lord. So there has to be a consistency in how you do things. This sounds like a harsh message. It's not a harsh, it's going to turn out real nice because God's going to fire something up in your spirit. But you got to hear it like this. If I just come and like, you know, I, I, people that are politically correct, I can't, I can't get along with because I'd rather tell you things raw, how they are, than just pat you on the back, tell you things are just going to be all right. That's what most preachers do. I'm not that preacher. Most people are satisfied with just telling you things. That, I mean, you can hear it all over TV. Go on TV. Go Christian television. God's going to come through for you. No, just keep hanging on. What are we all hanging on to? <laughs> just keep hanging on. Things are going to turn. No. You don't just keep hanging on. You find out what God said to do. You do it, and God is faithful. He will bring it to pass in Jesus' name. When you pray, you've got to keep a consistency in prayer. I'm not saying you have to pray four hours a day. I'm not saying that. Start, it's like muscles. You start off by building up your spirit being, by praying five minutes a day, ten minutes a day. Tw then finally, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, then you'll find a, pl a, a place where you can't even get in the prayer closet without leaving and looking at your clock and it's already been an hour. That'll happen naturally. Just like a bodybuilder when he goes to the gym. At first, I, obviously I don't go to the gym. <laughs> but if I were to go to the gym today, I wouldn't jump on the 100 pound weights, you know, doing dumbbell, what do you call those, curls with 100 pound weights. I wouldn't be able to. I'd, ri I'd rip my wrist apart. I'd be in the hospital. So what I'd start off with, I'd start off with the 20s, 25 maybe. I'll do a few reps. I won't get on the bench press machine and start doing 200 pounds. I'll start doing my, you know, maybe just the bar just to get myself warmed up. That's how it's got to be with spiritual things. The Bible says that bodily fitness is of some value, but then Paul actually compares bodily training with spiritual training. When he says, but training for godliness is profitable unto all things, since it holds promise in the life that now is and in the life that is to come. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. So, as a, as a, if your, your, your spirit being is like a muscle, and your faith is like a muscle, and those, those you have, that means you have to start by doing, practicing those things in little measures, but then eventually it'll grow. Just like a man who goes to McDonald's all the time. <laughs> never steps foot in the gym. That guy is not going to be nice and, you know, thin and athletic looking. He's going to, you know, look a little stocky and stuff. He's not eating right. He's not putting right things in his system. If you, all, you know, you're always feeding your flesh, you spend four, five, six hours on Netflix binging, you're 10 hours on Facebook newsfeed, and then after you, you go to prayer and you're like, oh, Lord, why can't I pray? Well, you've been praying three minutes a day. You've been, re you know, watching Netflix for 10 hours straight. What do you think? <laughs> you know, it's just common sense for most, for most of this stuff. But I'm telling you, God's going to drive something in your spirit tonight where it's not going to be a burden to go into the house of prayer. It's not going to be a burden to wake up early to get into prayer. Not that there's a time that you have to pray. You can pray whatever time you want. I'm a night, I night owl. I pray at night. I pray best at night. Jesus was both. Sometimes he woke up early in the morning. Sometimes he stayed up late at night. It doesn't matter what time you pray. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is that you have to pray. Jesus started off, Matthew 6, when you pray, then he gives you an outline how not to do things. Do not be as the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who's, who is in the secret place. What does that mean? When you, I, I want an encounter with God. I want to meet God. Get into the prayer closet. He's in the secret place, the Bible says. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will himself reward you openly. Everybody say, God is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. When you pray, don't, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they'll be heard for their many, their many words. Do not be like them. For your heavenly Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory, the power, and the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. So what does he say then? Don't be like the hypocrites who like to do things openly, but really they have no prayer life behind closed doors. And you can tell when someone gets up to pray publicly and they don't pray really. You can tell right away. They have no weight on their words. It's easy to spot them out. That man who prayed tonight, you can tell he's a prayer warrior. Because when he opened his mouth, it's like some things shifted. Me uh, Melody, when she opens her mouth, Kirby, I know is a man of prayer because I've known him from before. When you can tell right away, it's like there's some people who get up and pray and it like almost sucks the anointing out of the room. Other people will get up and pray and it's like the glory of God just falls. And it's easy to sense the presence of God. He says, don't be like the hip, he calls them pretenders. Hypocrites in the Greek is actually pretenders, actors who just get up when it's time to get up publicly. Then he says, don't be like one who just utters vain repetitions. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's not mental. <laughs> Imagine, carry, 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 carry. I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. With all, 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 all my heart, heart, heart. Carry, 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 carry. You don't have to do that. He's a person. That's what we got to get out of our heads. God is not some mystical idea in your head. He's not some theory that men came up with so as to create a crutch in life that we can lean on. He is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords, the Chief of Chiefs, the God of all creation. And when you cry out, He will hear you and pull you out of all your, your problems and troubles. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel 1. Point number one is you must engage God with heartfelt prayer. If it doesn't move, if your prayers don't move your heart, it will not move the hand of God. This is a story of a woman named Hannah. And she, I'll skip, oh no, I'll read it, I'll read it. From verse 1, 1 Samuel 1, 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeron, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and e I'm glad I'm named Timothy. The son of Zoph. I'm sorry if I offended you, Zoph, if there's any Zophs here. An Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Pan Panina. Panina, or Panina, whatever way you want to pronounce that, had children. But Hannah had absolutely no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Or Shiloh, however you want to pronounce that. Also the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely, severe, severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Imagine that. How twisted of an individual do you have to be? The poor woman's barren, and you don't like, you know, send her a Hallmark card or something. Don't <laughs> provoke her. Provoke her. That, if you look at the actual uh, Hebrew, it actually meant she was like taunting her, making fun of her because of her disability. How terrible is that? Imagine someone's blind and you're just... You know, ripping them up for being blind, as if they chose to be blind. You know, people are really messed up. A lot of people are really messed up. Evil people. That, that was someone anointed by hell to be a discouragement to Hannah. You know, just as God has anointed men and women to encourage people, the devil has anointed men and women to discourage people. Understand that. He'll have people that he'll specifically have come around you. At the worst times of your life. Just to tell you how, how you, you know, look at Job. Job is going through the worst trial of his life. And what happens? He has two dumb friends that get around him and start telling him it's because of what he's done. Even though the Bible says he was a blameless man. You can't ignore that there are principalities and powers in heavenly places that try and Ruin people's lives by discouraging them. Because if the devil gets you discouraged, he's robbed you of your fight. And you'll never, you'll never fight if you have no energy in you. And if you can't fight, what is it? He doesn't even have to fight you anymore. He just lays down and 
watches you wallow in whatever's been permeating your system and destroying you from the inside. So the de- you got to watch out for people like that. Stick away from people like that. And you can recognize them immediately. When you hang around them, are you happy when you leave or do you feel like hanging yourself? That's a pretty good way of, of, of finding out. There's people where you just, you won't feel nice. You can sense it in your spirit. You came, and you know what most of you, we had a great meeting this morning. I'm sure some of you went home and you got a phone call from someone just to say, I can't believe you went to church today. How could you invest your, you gave your tithe and offering there? How could you do that? Look, I'm not calling you and telling you how could you give your money to Marlboro. I'm not calling you and saying, hey, listen, can't believe you went to that strip club yesterday. You shouldn't, I'm not doing that. Keep it to yourself. People have no problem with giving money to everyone and anyone. But when it comes to the church, you'll have family members. How could you tithe your money to him? All they want is your money. I'm not, I don't go to church because they want my money. I don't go to church because I want money. I'm, I'm in church because God touched me, and I love him for that. Amen. The devil will see to it. Even after a meeting like this, you'll have the greatest breakthrough of your life. Healed in your body. And I, I'm, I'm not saying this as a confession of doubt. I'm just telling you. Watch out because there will be people that the devil will assign to you as he sees you leave this place with that smile on your face, but he's, ne- he's not seen in two years. He's kept you in bondage for the last two, three years. You've not been able to smile. Now you leave this place smiling, and he'll send people. He'll assign people from hell. The kingdom of hell has organization. Understand that. They're very organized, sometimes more organized than some churches. And he'll send people to put discouragement in your heart like he did to Job. And if Job had listened to his friends, he would have went down the same route. But thank God he had another friend, Elihu. Thank God my name's TJ once again. (laughs) Thank God he had another friend that came out and encouraged him, the Bible says. And then what happened? After two years of being afflicted by Satan, the Lord restored sevenfold everything that the devil had stole from him. Lift your hands all over this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, everything and anything the devil's made at his point in business to rob from your life, to take from you the joy that's been sucked dry from you in Jesus' mighty name, it comes back sevenfold. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength. You're leaving this place a brand new person in Christ Jesus. If you believe that, take 10 seconds, clap your hands, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Joel chapter 1, verse 12, I believe it is. Or it might be 2.12. The Bible says the pomegranate tree is dried up. The vineyard is dry up. The apple tree is dried up. Joy has, joy has withered away from the sons of men. If the, joy, the, the devil can suck the joy out of you, what happens? Things begin. Joy is a supernatural benefit from God that actually causes increase and acceleration in everything else you do. I mean, if you have a corporation and they're looking for someone to hire, they're not going to hire the person, and this is like proven statistically, they won't hire someone that's sat all the time. They won't, they're going to hire the guy that has an uplifted spirit. The Bible actually says if joy gets sucked out from you, everything else around you will begin to wither. But when God fills you with his joy, everything else around you will begin to increase and increase and increase until there's no more room for increase in Jesus' name. Her rival provoked her, to ang- to, uh, provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed the room. So it was year by year. She went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and didn't eat. It's another thing. It's not good for your health to be sad. You need joy to maintain vitality and health. That's a proven thing, scripturally and non-scripturally. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit actually dries the bones. The Bible says a cheerful heart makes a cheerful countenance. You look vibrant when you're happy. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, 
Hannah, why do you weep? Why aren't you eating? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? He was humble. Isn't that typical of a man to say that? <laughs> so Hannah rose after she had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the, pro the priest was sitting on the seat of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. She was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was actually drunk. What did I say point one was? Engaging God with all your heart. Eli thought she was drunk. So verse 14, Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Anna answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm, not, I'm a woman of a, of a sorrowful spirit. I'm not drunk nor intoxicated, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I've spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition which you've asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and she was no longer sad. I want you to notice something here. When she prayed, she prayed with such a fervency that she was weeping. Her mouth was moving, but nothing was heard out of her mouth. She was at the, the Bible says, at the steps of the altar, at the steps of the temple. And she wept and wailed. But it was, the Bible says, sometimes we don't know how to pray as we ought to, but the Spirit Himself utters things through our spirit in utterances and groanings which cannot be uttered by human voice. It's when God, when you're praying to God and you connect so closely to Him where you begin to pray prayers that are engaged, not, your mouth may not make any sound, but your heart is totally and absolutely engaged in prayer. That's the type of prayer that gets God's, God's attention. The Bible says in 1 Kings 18, when Elisha had taunted the prophets of Baal, and they came out and they laid a, a sacrifice out, and they tried to call their gods, and, and Elijah began to mock them, saying, where's your God? He's on a vacation. And then afterwards, Elisha sets up an altar. He pours water on the altar. Then he goes away. And with a 10-second prayer, but from his heart, totally engaged, he says, Father, may it be known today that you are God in Israel. And within 10 seconds, fire falls from heaven and consumes the altar. If you want to look in another area, in 1 Kings 18 as well, when he's praying for rain to come, the Bible says there was no rain or dew at Elijah's word for three and a half years, except at his word. And when he prayed again, the Bible says the heavens gave rain. But how was he praying? We have to recognize his attitude in prayer, his physical attitude in prayer. His spiritual attitude in prayer. What happened? The Bible says he had his servant come up to him and he said, Go, for I hear the, the sound of a mighty, mighty rainstorm. And he begins to pray. The Bible says he was actually bent double and his head was between his knees. He was so engaged in prayer, such a violence of, of faith was being demonstrated in his prayer that his head was between his knees. Imagine you're praying so hard that you're bent over and saying, Father, I pray, send rain right now. Most people in America, when they pray, I mean, it's like. Jesus. They look like weirdos. God doesn't answer prayers like that. All throughout scripture, you'll never see it. Look at those two blind men. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Then the crowd told them to shut up because they were making a ruckus. And they, di they didn't listen to the voice of the crowd. They cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. What happened? Jesus stood in his tracks and said, bring those two men to me. What do you want me to do for you? Totally engaged, spirit, soul, and body. As a result, they opened up God's will for whatever they wanted God was going to do. What did they say? Lord, that we may regain our sight. It is to you as you, as you believe. 
regain your sight. There's an attitude in prayer that has to be tapped into before you can engage real, heavenly, supernatural results. Yes. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? So number one, engage God with prayer. Number two, engage uh, with, uh, with heartfelt prayer. Number two, engaging God with His Word. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. The Bible says in Isaiah 41, 21, state your case before me. Bring forth your strong reasons. Well, you can't go to prayer empty-handed. It makes It's a poor lawyer that comes before a judge without preparing his case. Imagine a lawyer came before a judge and said, you know, give me, give me uh, justice for my adversary. Okay, what's your, what's your evidence here? Why should I give you that? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, don't you believe me? No. No, I don't believe you. God is the same way. The Bible says in Luke 18, I started saying it before, that there was a, a widow who sought justice from her adversary, but there was a, a judge in that city who neither feared God nor did what was right. And he did not regard the person of man, which means he didn't care about people. And that widow came constantly before him and said, give me justice from my adversary. Finally, the widow ended up, the, the judge ended up saying, even if I don't fear God and I don't care about people, but because of this widow's continual coming to me, you know, what did I say? Engaging God with your heart, totally, totally absorbed in, in getting an answer with, from God. Yeah. Because of this widow's continual coming to me, I will give her whatever she wants. Then Jesus said, learn the lesson from an unjust judge. And will not God... Answer his, his elect speedily who cry out to him day and night. So God cons compared himself to a judge who was, who was having to deal over a case. The Bible says, Isaiah 41, state your case before me and bring forth your strong, re uh, your strong reasons. Then in Isaiah 43, 26, it says, put me in remembrance of my word. You can't come to God empty handed. You need to have your case outlined. That's why when I prepare any type of prayer, when I'm going, I don't go empty-handed. I have a prayer book. I have things written out. I have prayer points written down. Point one, Father, increase the anointing. Lord, your word says in Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Father, your anointing is necessary in order to preach the gospel. Increase that anointing on me. Lord, your word says in 1 Timothy, that let him that speak, speak as the oracle of God. Father, enable my mouth to speak as an oracle, as if you're speaking through me. I have points reserved. I have points for everything. If, if, if someone gets sick, I don't show up to their house and just pray for them. I sit down with them first, and I explain to them why God wants to heal them, what God did in order for them to be healed, and why God's going to heal them right now. You, that's why a lot of people, they go up into hospitals, they, they pray for people, no one gets healed. It's not because God didn't want anyone healed. It's because you've got to teach people. The Bible says in Luke 5, 17, that Jesus was teaching on a given day. And many of the Sadducees and the chief priests of the religious law came and gathered around him. And the presence of the Lord was, uh, the power of the Lord was present there to heal them. The power of the Lord was present there because Jesus invoked that, pres that presence. Why? How? Through teaching. As he taught the crowds, the Bible says the multitude gave heed and the multitude sought to touch him. Philip, he went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. What was the result? The multitudes gave heed, seeing and hearing the miracles which he did perform. So miracles in anyone's life, through prayer or even just through ministry, laying on of hands, come as a, comes as a result of knowing God's word and declaring that word. That's why when I go to God in prayer, it's just the word that flows. That's why when you hear me preach, I'm not preaching my own opinion. It's the word of God flowing through my mouth. Because I can tell you what I think. I can tell you what I heard in some other, you know, some book I read. But that won't change your life. The Bible says it's the word of the Lord that endures forever. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But God's word is forever. The Bible says forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in the heavens. God's going to settle you today by his word in Jesus' mighty name. So Isaiah 40, 43, 26. Put me in remembrance of my word. 
and state your case that you may be acquitted. God works the same way. When you prepare, when you go to prayer, that's why a lot of people can't go past five minutes of prayer because they don't have anything prepared. So they come, Father, I pray, bless my family today. Bless my hands when I go to work. Bless the food I eat today. Bless the food I didn't pray for earlier. <laughs> Father, bless my sister, bless my brother. And then they start looking at their clock because they don't know what else to pray for. Instead, come to God with a game plan. I'm gonna, that's when God sees us, man, that guy's serious. That guy needs business. A lawyer who came in without any notes, the judge easily will dismiss him. And even though the guy's innocent, he might even still lose his case because he didn't prepare. And that's happened many times where people who were innocent took the electric chair because the lawyer didn't do the right job. It's true. A lot of people, they don't get answers from God because they don't know the Word of God. Engage God with the Word of God. Luke chapter 7 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus concluded all these sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. When he came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, The one that whom, for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and built us a synagogue. When Jesus, then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be made whole. Amen. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes to another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turned around, and said to the crowd that followed him, Assuredly, I say unto you, I have not found such great faith, not even in all of Israel. And those who were sent returned to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. Just speak the word. What does the Bible say? Psalm 107. He sent forth his word, and it healed them. When you come to God, if you're sick in your body, find scriptures in that deal with physical infirmity. Exodus 15, 26. The Bible says, Because you take heed unto my voice, I will put none of the diseases upon you, which I put upon the Egyptians. Father, you said that if I would stay obedient to you, you would, put, you would not allow any disease on me that is allowed on this world. Therefore, this has no place in my body. Father, then you can absolutely know that it's God's will to take it off of you. There's no... If you have any doubt concerning the will of God, you'll be in absolute frustration and confusion because nothing will ever happen. He that doubts is like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro. Let not that man expect to receive anything. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, the Bible says this, Therefore we have this confidence before God, that if we ask anything according to His will, and the Word of God is what? The express written will of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the begin he was in the beginning with God. Talk then the Word became flesh and dwelt, dwelt among, them, among us. Talking about Jesus. Then in Hebrews 1.3, it says that Jesus was the express will, the express nature of God. The express revelation of the will of God. So the Word of God is the express will of God. So when you read His Word, you can know His will. So you don't have to pray that dumb, stupid prayer. Lord, if it be thy will, heal me in my body. That's nonsense. If it be thy will. Are you blind? Have you read the word enough? Jesus never went up to a sick person and said, I will that thou be made sick. No, he always went up to them and said, I will that thou be made whole. Rise up, take up your mat, and walk. That man who was, who was a leper. What happened? He came before Jesus. He falls before him and worshiped him. Then G uh, he, Jesus took heed unto him. He said, Lord, if thou will, you can make me clean. I'm so happy he asked that question. Because now, because Jesus answered that, and that's in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. Because Jesus answered him, and God does not show any favorites, we know that that same answer pertains to us. What did he say? He didn't say, well, now, now, 
That's right, if I did will, you can be made whole. But because I don't will, let me kick that finger off your hand that's already withering away because he was a leper. No. He didn't say, hey, let's get Brother Luke over here. He has some lotion in his back. It's good for leprosy. Apply this three times a day and uh, things will get a bit better. That's not what he said. He actually got frustrated. He, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. I will be thou made clean. Then he, t he did the, the, the inexplicable in that day. You, I mean, you touch a leper today. It was the most contagious thing. It's still the most, it's super contagious. If you go to third world nations where leprosy is still a thing, you touch a leper, you'll catch leprosy. But Jesus, so anointed, full of the Holy Ghost, went about doing good, doing what? Destroying every oppression of the devil, for God was with him. Stretched forth his hand, touched him. Be thou made whole. And he was instantly made whole. Completely. No more leprosy. Not he regained a few fingers, but the majority of his body was still, no. Completely whole. Because when the will of God came to, the, to light, that man's faith jump-started, man. To the point where he didn't have to wonder anymore. Stop wondering if it's God's will to heal you. Stop wondering if it's God's will to deliver you. The Bible says God is not willing that any of his children should perish. That doesn't mean, just mean going to hell. It means living like hell on earth. God doesn't want any of you living like hell on earth. God's will for his children is to make you the head and never the tail. To seat you above and never ever beneath. The Bible says all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Why? Because you love the Lord your God. And that's where I see you going today in the name of Jesus Christ. Not from cursing a cursing, but from blessing a blessing. Because surely goodness and mercy shall follow me every day of my life. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. You got to engage God with your word, with the word. Don't pray your own opinions. Number three, engage God with violent praise. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. That means don't care about anything. You know, the Bible says in Philippians 1.28 that there's actually a way to thwart off any attack or assault from hell within the first few minutes. How? In no way terrified by your adversary, which is a sign of them of destruction, but of you of salvation and that through God. Some of you, whenever the devil comes your way, already, you're, you're, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay that bill? How am I going to, what, my kids, they're not going to eat tonight. Don't do that. The second you start voicing that. What did Jesus say? Matthew 6. Do not worry about your life as to what you'll eat, as to what you'll drink, nor about your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look, consider the lilies of the field. Now they, ne they neither toil nor spin. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And are you not of much more value than they, which today are, but tomorrow are thrown into the oven? And consider the ravens, how they neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than the ravens? Some, you can't show the devil any concern or worry. The Bible says in, in Psalms, do not worry, it only causes harm. The second you, you know, that's exactly what the devil wants to do. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas, after they preached, they, they had mighty revival in, uh, I forget what town it was, Philippi. Philippi. They had a mighty revival, and, and, and what happens? The Bible says that the people were, because of the, the idol making business, went to poops. <laughs> they ended up getting, you know, stirring up the crowd and had the chief. Priests, and, uh, not the chief priest, but the chief like council, take Paul and Silas and throw them into the inner stocks of the prison. Threw them into the darkest place in the dungeon. Then had them fastened with the heaviest of chains. And if you study, they actually were fastened like this. The least comfortable thing. You're, you imagine you're there all night like this. It sucks. Your blood, you know, your blood's not going, there's no blood circulation in your arms. You end up going white up there. So what happens? They could have easily have just said, God, didn't you call us to preach? 
God, didn't you call us to do mighty works? God, didn't you call us for such a time as this? But instead, what did they do? The Bible says at midnight, the midnight hour, doesn't matter how dark it looks like right now, doesn't matter how deep you are in junk, doesn't matter how deep you are in darkness, the Bible says God is able to do far more abundantly and exceedingly all that you can ask, think, or imagine. The devil thought he had you, but tonight God's going to take you up, raise you up, and show you off to this generation as a mighty testimony. At midnight, the Bible says, Paul and Silas were weeping in their own cells and crying and asking God for help. No, the Bible says they were praying and singing hymns unto God. Then what happened? All the prisoners were listening to, to them. That doesn't mean they were just humming. They weren't ashamed of that praise. They weren't ashamed of the gospel because it was the power of God at work in their lives. They sang loud and clear. They proclaimed it high and up. And the decibel level wasn't at like, you know, what's a low decibel level? I don't know those it wasn't at like 30, 40 decibels. It was loud. And as a result, all the prisoners heard them. Then what happened? The Bible says suddenly. Everybody say suddenly. suddenly. Everybody say suddenly. suddenly. Suddenly at the midnight hour, there was a great and mighty earthquake so that the prison doors were open. And not just their prison door, but everyone's prison doors were open. My brother and sister, if you'll stop wallowing and complaining and start thanking God, saying the Lord, he is good. His mercy is everlasting. He's not failed me yet. He'll not fail me now. My God is able to do above and beyond all that I can ask. He will pull through for me. What will happen? God will send an earthquake. He'll break every prison door open. He'll take out every shackling chain and you'll run out of that place free by the power of God. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer, supplication, along with thanksgiving. People miss that part. They enter into the presence, the presence of, well, they're not even get to the presence of God because the Bible says, enter his gates how? There are ways to do things. So it's not me making things up. I'm trying to help you, give you the instructions so that you, oh, that's why. That's why I never feel that presence in the room. That's why I never, you know, I, I never get anything answered. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. If you haven't done that, it's like you're, you're just at the gate, hitting your head on the gate constantly. You've not, you don't have any permission to enter in. You know, if back in the day, if you came into a king's court and you didn't come in properly, you'd die. They'd kill you right on the spot. I'm not saying God's going to strike you down. People are going to leave tonight. Man, that guy's really. <laughs> but there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. Can you say amen? amen. That's why some people get 40% on a test and other people get 100% on a test. It's very, very simple. Along with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. Then what will happen? The God of peace, or the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Then he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are right, whatever things are pure, if there's anything lovely or anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. Coming to point four. Point number four. You got to check what your thought process is on a daily basis. The Bible says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Which strongholds? Mental stronghold. What's one of the weapons of God? The Word of God. My, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. Therefore, brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God, present yourselves a living and holy sacrifice, which is a, your reasonable service of, of worship. And be not conformed to this world. But what? Be transformed. How? By the renewal of your mind. How do you do that? By getting the Word... And what did Jesus say? If, you'll, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is focused, your whole body will be full of light. If you keep your eyes steadfast on the word of no, David, everybody looks at David. Well, I, wouldn't, I have so many Goliaths in my life. What was David's secret? I rejoice at thy law, O Lord, as one who's found great treasure. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. 
Constant obsession. Oh, Psalm 119, verse 97 through 100. Oh, how I love thy law, o Lord. It is my meditation all the night. For thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than all my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your precepts, your testimonies, are my meditation constantly. Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law, that Bible, shall not depart from thy mouth. But thou shalt be careful. Everybody say, I'm going to be careful. <laughs> to meditate on this book day and night. For then yes. shall my way be prosperous. And you will have good success. It's crazy how when you turn the lights on, people are like, oh. I can see some of your faces. It's, it's actually really nice. Things are like turning on for you. That's what it is. Thy word is what? A lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. Then what happens when you get that word in you? The Bible says the path of the just is like a shining sun. It shines brighter and brighter even unto the perfect day. You get this word in you, you start acting it out, your life will not go from valley to valley, from pity to pity, from shame to shame, but from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from mountain top to mountain top, from victory to victory, as you appear before Zion in Jesus' mighty name. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. You got to get your mind. As a man thinks within himself, so is he. So it doesn't matter. Even, you know, I'm going to get on the confession part of things. But even if you're confessing things, but it's not rooted in a heartfelt belief in what you're saying, that's what's called hypocrisy. You got to get this sown in your heart. To the point where Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will naturally speak. Ask my wife. I, I, I prepare for sermons and all, but I don't prepare this deep in. But because I get the, I, I eat this up. Jeremiah said this. I rejoice, at, uh, no, Jeremiah said this. Your words were found and I ate them. I digested them. I got them into my digestive tract. And it became for me. The joy and gladness of my heart. So that when I get up, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to say. I never have to worry about, you know, what if I, I get... I, n I never have a problem of speaking too, too little. I don't have a church that says, hey, you, you didn't make the 45 minutes tonight. It's more like, you went an hour and 45 minutes tonight. <laughs> Why? Not because, it's not my own, you know, I'm, just like they said, don't look at me. It's not like there's a different, not like some different species. It's just because there has to be a diligence applied. There has to be a focus applied. That's why Paul said this. It's like we're running in a race. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that all run in a race, but only one can obtain the prize? Certain, you know, what did he say to Timothy? No soldier entangled in the affairs of this life will please the one who enlisted him. Then he says... No athlete is crowned unless he competes according to the rule. There has to be diligence in place. That's why the Bible says, the hand of the slack will become poor, but the, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. Can you say amen? amen? Turn your Bibles to... Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. Point number, well, point number four will be having an overcomer's mentality constantly. Amen. Point number five will be maintain a constant confession. Maintaining constant confession. The Bi I'm not going to get through the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you the precursor or the context of what's going on here. Paul asked to appear before Caesar at Rome. Then he goes on a ship, and as he's on that ship, an angel of the Lord appears to him and tells him, tell them not to set sail, because if they do, they'll be shipwrecked. So he tells the people, but well, how many of you know, you can tell people things a hundred times over, but it's up to them to obey. They didn't obey, and what happened? They got shipwrecked. So they're on an island now. Uh, no, they're not on an island. They're shipwrecked somewhere. They're like... They can't even lay anchor because you don't lay anchor in a storm. Or you'll like die. 
So they don't lay anchor, and they're just being drifted away and away. Then they start dropping things over, overboard because the weight of the ship is too, too much. They start throwing food. Then finally they want to kill the prisoners. But because of Paul, he had like good standing with the chief, the, chief prison, the chief prison attendant. The guy ended up saving all the prisoners. Then, if you look in verse, verse 21, verse 20. Acts 27, verse 20. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, that's a, what you call a mandatory fast, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Man, you should have listened to me, and not have set sail from Crete and cured such disaster and loss. Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood me by this night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take, get this, verse 25. Therefore, take heart, for I believe God that it shall be just as I have been told. He didn't lose confession because of his circumstance. His confession never altered. Hebrews 10.23 Hold fast to the confession of your faith without wavering. For he that promised is faithful. You can't let situations and circumstances dictate the way you speak. Because the Bible talks about what words do. The Bible says a man's words will satisfy, a man will be satisfied by the words of his mouth. And he'll be filled by the produce of his lips. This mouth is like a production plant. So, you know what, people, you'll pray heartfelt prayers, you'll pray according to the word of God, you'll even praise when you leave. But if when you leave the, the prayer closet, you start speaking things completely opposite to everything you just, you just prayed for, don't expect God to come through. You can't speak negative confession and expect positive results. It's impossible. It's impossible. A man, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, that, actually, let's turn there. This is something that everyone should see. Amen. Starting from verse 20, actually. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. The produce of his lips he shall be filled. You know, in James chapter 4, what does it say? Actually, it's James chapter 3. That your tongue, though it's the smallest part of your body, I mean, obviously your ossicles and stuff in your ear smaller but one of the smallest parts of your body it has such a, a, a force that it, it can actually change the course of your life then he compares it to a rudder on a ship he says look, look at the rudder of ships though it's so small on a ship yet though the big ship is driven by fierce storms and rain that little rudder actually dictates where the ship goes not the storms in the rain doesn't matter what's coming on you doesn't matter what's come on you. Doesn't matter what you've been going through. Your mouth is your release form. What happened to Jesus? Mark chapter 4. The Bible says that they came and no small storm came upon them. The disciples began to panic and worry. And they came to Jesus who was what? Doing what? Sleeping in the stern. Just rest assured. Sleeping blessedly assured. What did, what did he say before that? He said this. We go over to the other side. So if Jesus said we're going to make it to the other side, there's no storm that can take you out. If God said you're going to have that business, there's no storm, there's no devil that can take that from you. If God said you're going to have health, there's no demonic opposition that can tie the hands of God from bringing you that health. So what happened? Mark chapter 4. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Finally he gets up. Oh, faithless generation. How did he know they were faithless? He didn't need the word of knowledge. He saw their mouths. What their mouth spoke re revealed the faith in their heart. What your mouth speaks is a direct representation of your level of faith. Then what did Jesus do? Did he get on his knees and pray, Father, you said we'd get to the other side? No. He had already prayed on the mountaintop if you read it. 
He had built up the authority that God had vested in him enough to the point where he didn't have to play games with the devil. But that demonically inspired storm, when Jesus got up, he looked straight at it and he said in our man, shut up and be still. And the Bible says that the men and disciples were astonished because the peace of the storm. They were all fishermen. They had been on, they had been in fierce storms. They had been in peaceful storms. People, peaceful seas. But the Bible uses words that describe such a peace that they had never even experienced as unto date. He didn't pray. He got up and he spoke to the storm. You know, I spoke on prayer tonight, but there's also a lot of things that you've been praying for too long that you don't need to pray anymore. You need to get up and realize that Jesus already accomplished that for you at the cross. You need to get up and use that weapon called the Word, the sword of the Spirit, and cut the devil off your life tonight in Jesus' name. Jesus didn't pray at that point. He rebuked the storm. Peter's mother-in-law, she's sick, lying sick with a fever. Jesus comes in. Couldn't, you know, Jesus couldn't stand being in an atmosphere of sickness to the point where no one asked him to pray for his mother-in-law, for Peter's mother-in-law. He just went right away and he rebuked the fever and immediately the fever left her. He didn't pray for healing. He rebuked the fever and the fever left her. And she rose up and served them. That's not she felt a little better, but she still got some rest and drank water for the rest of the day. No, she was 100% restored. That's what's going to happen to you tonight in Jesus' mighty name. I really feel it in my spirit. I preached on prayer. But tonight, I fin I'm finishing it with this. With confession. And with the power of one's mouth. Because Ma Mark chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. What does it say? Have faith in God. Then what does he say? For assuredly I say unto you, whosoever. Say, whosoever is me. Whosoever is all-inclusive. Anybody. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Not whosoever shall pray about this mountain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Be thou what? Uprooted and cast into the midst of the sea. And does not doubt in his heart. But believes that those things which he has spoken will come to pass. He will have whatever things he speaks. Then he goes on in verse 24. Therefore, whatsoever things he ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it shall be granted unto you. Lift your hands all over this place. That mountain that you've prayed for long enough tonight in the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority of the message of the gospel and what Jesus did at the cross, how he made a public humiliation of the kingdom of hell, Every mountain represented in your life, every area of concern, every area of worry, whether it be in the form of depression, anxiety, mental torment, physical body, affliction, doesn't matter what it is, marital distress, maybe it's your, your children that have gone astray from the Lord, maybe it's your father and mother who doesn't serve the Lord anymore, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command that mountain uprooted now and cast into the deepest pit of hell in Jesus' name. Never to return again. Do you know that Jesus actually told his disciples, Matthew 18, 18? I give you power now. Whatsoever things you bind on earth. He told Peter, now I give you the keys of the, of the kingdom of heaven. Tell, say, tell your neighbor, I have a key. I have a key. And that key is not to unlock your car. It's to unlock everything that you need in life. Whatsoever things you bind on earth. That devil has no right harassing you. That devil has no right staying there a moment longer. Jesus Christ already gave you the authority bestowed on every believer to take out that key. Bind whatsoever you will to buy. It shall be bound into heaven. Yes, we wrestle against, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yes, we wrestle against principalities and powers. But God in his rich mercy has provided a way to not stay under the devil's feet, but to rise up and have the devil under our feet to stay in dominion. The Bible says, in Psalm 8, that God, 
You know, David was completely astonished. And he says, what is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you even visited. Yet you've made us a little lower than the angels. And you've crowned us with great glory and strength. You have made us to have dominion over all the work of your hands. And have placed all things under our feet. Can you say amen? amen. Like I, I preached on this morning in Ephesians 2. He's raised us up with Christ Jesus. He made us to sit with him in heavenly places. Far above every power, every principality, every name that is named. And the good thing is that what are we praying? I'm going to close with this. We're praying what? We don't pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said what? Most assuredly I say unto you, whatsoever things you ask in my name, the Father will hear you and he will grant you that desire. That's why when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and he saw a dead body, he didn't get discouraged. He said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of those standing by, I'm, asking, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm saying this, that you hear me. So that they may know that you've sent me. Then what did he do? Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says he came forth bound, hand and feet. He didn't pray about it. He used the authority. We have authority in the name of Jesus to bring every irreversible situation back to its reversal. There's nothing the devil's done to you that God can't do something about tonight. And he will come through for you in Jesus' name. Stand up on your feet. Lift up your hands, everybody. I already start thanking God. We're going to have a glorious night. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We pray to, to the Father in that name, that beautiful name, that wonderful name, the name of Jesus. Then when Peter and John were on the way to the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, what happened? They saw a cripple. They saw a problem. They saw something that was not right in that man. He couldn't walk. What did he do? They didn't just give him alms. He begged of alms. But then he said, look on us. Why? Because we got something that this world needs. You know, too many Christians, they're saying, it's not me, it's, it's God. It is God, but it's God through you. That's why they could say, look on us. And the man looked at them expecting to, to receive something from them. How many of you are expecting to receive something tonight? He looked at them expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter and John, fixing their eyes on him, said, silver and gold have not I. He wasn't saying they were poor. They just knew that there's no amount of money. That would keep him happy as long as he remained crippled. It wasn't a confession that they were poor. It's just we don't have the level of silver and gold you need to stay happy. Because you'll always be crippled. But such as I do have, give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ. The Christ, the Son of God. Get up and walk. Then he didn't just talk it. He didn't just talk to talk. He put his feet to work. He grabbed him from his right hand, lifted him up, and he immediately received strength in his ankle bones and feet. And he leapt up, praising God and rejoicing. Lift your hands all over this place. Start thanking God out of your mouth. Come on, let's, let's start making some noise. Don't wait for the musicians. Already start now. Sing a new song to the Lord. Tell him you love him. Th tell him, thank you, Lord, that I'm not living another day with this thing. Thank you, Father, that this chain's coming off me now. Thank you, Father, that you made a way out, that I can pray to you in the name of Jesus. And every area of concern, everything that's causing me worry will be supernaturally retracted from my life. Thank you, Father, that your word says that everything my heavenly Father has not planted, you will uproot. Thank you, Lord, that there's going to be an uprooting of every demonic stronghold in my life. Thank you, Father, there's going to be an uprooting of every fleshly characteristic trait that's been keeping me from more of you. Thank you, Father, that there's going to be an uprooting of everything that's been holding me down and keeping me from breakthrough. Today is my day. Now is the day that I'm moving forward. I'm reaching forward. I'm pressing on towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. My days of being in lack are behind me. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm not lacking another thing from this day forward. In Jesus' name.
Come on, you're sounding good. If you're here tonight, before I wanna, before I pray for people, I need to make this call. If you're here tonight, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Or maybe once upon a time you did, but you got drifted away, you got sidetracked, you started hanging out with the wrong people, and you know in your heart that you're not right with God. Today is your day. Now is the day to be saved. The Bible says now is the acceptable time of salvation. Don't push it off for another hour. Your, your breakthrough is just one prayer away. Your deliverance is just one prayer away. God will come through for you. But first, you need to be a son. You need to be a daughter. You need to come into the family of God. And I'm going to invite you now to pray a prayer with me that when you pray, God sends forth the spirit of his son, the spirit of adoption, that you now become a child, a daughter, a son of God. That you can actually pray to the Father, not to, just to some unknown God in the universe, but to the Father. Because that's what he is to us. So wherever you are, with everyone's heads bowed and eyes closed, on the count of three, you need to make right with God. I want you very quickly to slip your hand up. Three, two, one, wherever you are. God bless you. I see that hand. I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. I see that hand. If you lifted your hand very quickly, I want you to come forth right to these altars. I'm going to pray for you.
me with your spirit. Whatever needs to be taken out of my life, Father, by fire, remove it today. Lord, put a fire in my heart. For whatever struggles I used to have, Lord, they'll be easy to cut out of my life. This lady right here, step
Working God. 